listen to this. That last psalm made me think of Psalm 40. The very end of Psalm 40 says, As for me, well, actually, no, two verses. It says, But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation say continually, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. Anyone else get an amen to that? As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, oh my God. If you've got your Bibles, let's open them up to Exodus chapter 19. As you turn there, um, I just want to say that I sincerely hope and pray that this study uh, this fall has been a blessing to you. I really hope that as we've been going through the entire Bible, um, right, not from a 30,000 foot view, but not on the ground, uh, getting the big picture, right? I hope that it has been shaping your worldview. I hope that it's been changing the way that you look at the Bible and God and what your role in the world is. Uh, and so I just want you to know that. Uh, it's been a blessing to me, I know, to study and, uh, and to be challenged by my study through uh, this whole series. And so I hope as challenging and beneficial as it's been to me, I hope even more so for you. And so Tonight, like I said earlier, we are going to finish the book of Exodus, which is just unfair. Uh, three weeks in Exodus is not enough, um, but that's what we've got. And so, uh, at this point in the text, as we look to uh, Exodus 19, uh, really Exodus 15, God's new nation has just been birthed, if you remember this from last week. His new nation has just been birthed in the Passover Right? The people of God have just escaped Egypt, and they've just finished walking across uh, a sea on dry ground with walls of water on either side. And they look back, imagine if you were there, you look back at God getting glory over Pharaoh and all of his armies, all the hosts of Egypt, all the chariots, by crushing them under the water and then you and all your fellow Israelites party on the far side of the Red Sea. When we get to chapter 15, that is what's happening, right? This is no, uh, you know, conservative, dignified worship service in chapter 15, the song of deliverance. This is not people staring at a screen and just like singing some words. No, they are going after it. They are partying. They bust out the tambourines. They start dancing. They're thrilled with what God has done. And as that party dies down, they look out into their new future with God. Think about this. You're delivered. And you look out into your new future with God, and all you see is dusty, rocky desert. Dusty, rocky desert. This is the Sinai Peninsula. It's like that little triangular shaped piece of land between Egypt, Israel, and Saudi Arabia. Uh, after the people crossed the Red Sea, this is something of what they would have been looking at. And this unlikely place is where one of the most weighty events in the Old Testament and probably the most important event in Israel's history takes place. God gives his law to Israel. And this is where God chooses to make his covenant that will set Israel apart as the nation that bears his name. And so, as you guys look at your notes, I want to just make you aware of something. Uh, the, the portions that this lesson is going to cover is Exodus 15, 22 through the end of the book. But for the sake of time, um, I do not really have time to cover chapters 15 through 17. Um, and so what I've done in your notes is I've included 
based, I mean almost verbatim, what I wrote in my notes before I decided to cut it that you guys can read another time. Um, but we, we're pretty familiar. If you've been around the church for a bit, we're familiar with chapters, uh, especially 16 and 17, because this is where uh, after crossing the Red Sea, they make their trek into the desert and the people begin to complain. Do you remember this? Moses, we have no water, right? And so Moses tells the Lord, they're grumbling, we have no water. And God says, okay, I'm gonna provide. And then they say, God, we have no bread. We have nothing to eat, no meat. And God says, okay, I'm gonna give you bread from heaven. And I'm gonna give you uh, quail, right, to eat. I'm gonna satisfy you. Uh, and then after that, they go, God, we've got no water again. Uh, and so God says, I'm going to provide for you again. Um, and so the, the people are challenged uh, with these problems of provision and protection. In chapter 17, there's also the, the army of the Amalekites that comes against them. So they're challenged with provision and protection, uh, and they decide to test God instead of trust God. And there's a ton of application in there for us, but I will let you look at um, that portion of your notes another time, okay? And so... Uh, they go through all these trials. God is providing for them every single step of the way. And then we get to chapter 19. Chapter 19. This is where our study is going to kick off tonight. But look with me at Exodus chapter 19. We're going to read just a few first verses here. Chapter 19 verse 1 says this, On the third new moon, after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt... On that day, they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came into the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. Okay, so the Israelites have made their way into the depths of the Sinai Peninsula, the depths of the desert. Well, God has been providing for them, and uh, they come to, as the text says, the mountain the mountain or Mount Sinai or Mount Horeb is uh, another one of its names. But Moses is able to lead the people here because uh, earlier on when he was a shepherd in Midian, he was shepherding his uh, father-in-law's flocks, this would have been one of the places that he came. And so he knew this terrain really, really well. And this mountain, in fact, was the same mountain where he met God in the burning bush. And so Exodus 19 through the rest of the book really is uh, the fulfillment of the word that God had spoken to Moses in chapter 3, verse 12, where uh, Moses says, Lord, how will I know that what you're calling me to do and this whole deliverance thing is going to work out? And God says, here will be the sign. After I have delivered my people from Egypt, they will come to this very mountain and they will serve me. And here they are. They've been delivered, and now they're at the mountain serving God. And it's here where God uh, defines Israel's special identity. So let's pick up where we just left off in verse 3. The Lord called to him out of the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the people of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the people of Israel. We learned last week that the Exodus is Israel's birth story as God's firstborn son, or if you remember the Hebrew word for it, it's the Bahor. B-E-C-H-O-R, Behor, the firstborn son. Uh, and we said that the, being the firstborn son not only came with the blessing of a double portion of the inheritance, but also it came with the responsibility to carry on the, the legacy, the mantle, if you will, of your father and to provide for the whole family. Like you're now the guy if you're the firstborn son, okay? And here, God's divine purpose in creating Israel's new identity is defined using three metaphors. Did you guys see what they were? In verses five and six, three metaphors to describe his people. What does he say? What was it? Okay, kingdom of priests is one. Holy nation is two. Yep, treasured possession. So treasured possession, kingdom of priests, and 
holy nation. And these three really give us a 3D picture or, if you will, like a surround sound understanding of what God was doing in the Mosaic Covenant. And God's first purpose is that Israel, he says, would be his treasured possession. This is the same word, uh, interestingly, used in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3, for King David's personal vault of gold and silver. His personal vault, his treasured possession, his private treasure. Um, think of a, a palace having the national treasury and then the king having his personal vault. Think about the difference between those two in the heart of the king, right? Or if you think of the UK, think about the UK's, their national treasury, right? His majesty's treasury versus the crown jewels. Think about the difference between those two. To say you are going to be my treasured possession is like you are my crown jewel. Other ancient Near Eastern usage of this term uh, includes loyal service from one who belongs to a god. And so they would, uh, uh, people who weren't Israel, they would describe like the leader uh, or some type of elite person. They belonged to a god. They were that god's treasured possession. And Malachi chapter 3 verse 17 uses the term this way. They shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my treasured possession, and I will spare them as a man spares his son who serves him. So again, belonging to a God, treasured possession. Uh, Malachi 3.17 even uses that same idea as other ancient Near Eastern usage, because the, the comparison here is treasured possession and son. Obedient son. And so this connection, even in Malachi chapter 3, um, between treasure and service shows that Israel's relation to Yahweh was supposed to be one of devoted worship. And honestly, this brings us way back to the beginning. Uh, Israel here inherits an Adamic role. Adamic, referring back to Adam, right? Israel inherits an Adamic role and is to be the obedient son whom God has desired from the beginning He's desired and obedient son to partner with him. Do you guys remember that? All the way back in week one. Um, but how exactly would Israel be God's treasured possession? What does that really mean? The next two terms, kingdom of priests and a holy nation, uh, define how. And so rather than being taken as separate phrases, we should read these two as parallel lines in Hebrew poetry. If you're familiar with Hebrew poetry, parallelism is a, a, one of the defining characteristics of it. Uh, one line will be said, and then a second line will come into either contrast or compare or um, augment, right? Something like that. Um, so kingdom of priests and a holy nation should be taken together with kingdom being par uh, paralleled with nation, and then priests being paralleled with holy. And if we take these together, these unpack what it meant for Israel to be a treasured possession. And so let's take a look at the first one, a kingdom of priests. Uh, Hebrew scholar Peter Gentry states that this phrase can be interpreted to mean, he says, a domain of priests whom God rules, or alternatively, the exercise of royal office by those who are priests. He suggests we read this as God's intention for Israel to be both royal and priestly. Both royal and priestly. They are, if you think about this, they are to be kingly priests, but also priestly kings. Okay? The idea of royalty stretches back to Abraham. You guys remember this from a handful of weeks ago? Uh, the text clearly treats Abraham as some kind of kingly figure. Uh, and then it even stretches further back from Abraham all the way back to Adam, uh, who really was the son of the divine king who exercised royal rule on earth for the glory of the king. Right? Uh, and so that idea of royalty stretches way back. The idea of priesthood has already been mentioned in the sign of the Abrahamic covenant. Do you guys remember when we talk about the Abrahamic covenant, what was the sign of the covenant? Circumcision, right? And so, again, in this time, only kings and priests were circumcised. And so for this sign to be applied to Israel, the nation as a whole, 
uh, meant that all of Israel was to function as a priesthood to God. And so we have to ask, what is the role of a priest? What would you say? What's the role of a priest? Okay, you teach the people about God. You show them what God is like. That's like half of it. Yes. Crucial. Okay, so you bring people to God and you show them what God is like. If we were just going to put it very simply. You bring people to God, right? you mediate, uh, and then also you uh, teach them what God is like. Uh, additionally, priests are consecrated to the service of God, which leads us to that second phrase. We've got kingdom of priests, and then second, we have a holy nation. Nation parallels kingdom, but we have to ask, what does that word, that modifier, holy, mean? If someone were to ask you that, like this word is in your guys' songs, you talk about it a lot in sermons, holiness, what is holy? What would you say? Separate, set apart. What was it? Huh? Without sin? Yeah. Um, recently, I read something that really changed my perspective on holiness, the way I think about holiness. And most of our answers, right, like we just heard, uh, relate to moral purity or set apartness. There's a separateness that is intrinsic to holiness, okay? Uh, and I think that there is an aspect of that that is true, but it isn't entirely accurate. French evangelical scholar Claude Bernard Costacald, I don't even know how to say his last name, but he did an exhaustive study on uh, the biblical and ancient Near Eastern usage of that word holy and discovered that its basic meaning is not separated, but is rather consecrated or devoted consecrated or devoted to. One example of this would be, uh, think about the holy ground where Moses met God, the burning bush. Was that ground set apart or separate from other ground? No, it wasn't scooped up and put somewhere else. Uh, it was just ground. What made it holy? It was the fact that God was there and it was devoted to his meeting with Moses. It was consecrated in, the, in his holy presence. Uh, that is what made it holy. And so Israel would be a holy nation because they were dedicated to serving a holy God, not primarily because they were separate from other nations. And here's my point. Hear me please when I say this. Because you're like, Israel was separate from other nations. Yes, I know that. But listen to, listen to this. Their holiness was defined primarily by their yes, not just their no. Now, saying yes to God always necessitates saying no to the world. We know this from the book of James. You can't have God on one hand and the world on the other hand and expect to have God in the end. He says you must choose. So saying yes to God uh, necessitates saying no to the world, but there is a difference in seeing holiness fundamentally as a positive yes in God's direction rather than fundamentally as just a no in, from the world's direction. There is a difference. And so when taken all together, Israel as a whole would be God's treasured possession, and you may have even noticed this in uh, verse five. They would be his treasured possession among all the nations, but they would be his treasured possession for the sake of all the nations. As a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, they would not only show the world what it means to have a right relationship with God, but also what it means to have a right relationships with each other. They would identify with God, and with his ethics, they would share his concern for justice in the world. God's, think about, think about it this way, God's original intention for humanity, Genesis 1 and 2, would be showcased within Israel's borders. That's the idea behind 
all of this. And so in this way, as a kingdom of priests, bringing people to God, showing the nations what it's like to live in right relationship with God and to each other, in this way, they would be a blessing to all nations, thus fulfilling this promise that was made a long time ago that we've heard of to bless all nations, the promise to Abraham, right? Whereas we've been looking for, uh, like this second Adam idea has come up multiple times in our study. We've been looking for a second Adam in Cain, and then he wasn't it, and then Noah, and he's not it, and Abraham, and he's great, but he's still not it. Now, uh, Israel as a collective is like a new Adam. They're going to show the world what it's like to be with God. And did you know that much, much later in the Bible, this apostle named Peter uses the same exact language to describe the church. This is 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Let me know if this sounds familiar. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Isn't that interesting? We are described using the same language because Highland, we have the same responsibility. We, he says, we are God's treasured possession. You are a people for his own possession. It's the same idea. We are his treasured possession. We are a royal priesthood meant to be fully devoted to the service of God and who don't define ourselves by what we aren't, but by what we are. We are a holy people. This is not, I'm a Christian because I don't do these things. This is a, I'm a Christian because I know God. I'm a Christian because I'm devoted to service of God. That's what makes 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 true about me. Yes, I've said no to sin. Yes, I am called uh, to live a life that is different. But I'm not primarily defined by my no. I'm primarily defined by my yes. And so if we are to be victorious in the world, we must accept these realities, treasured possession, kingdom of priests, holy nation, as a core part of our identity as believers after hearing God's invitation, because this is an invitation in chapter 19, verses uh, five and six. After hearing God's invitation and his call, Israel accepts and then God meets with them. So let's pick up in chapter 19, verse seven. Uh, verse seven, so Moses came and called the elders of the people and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. All the people answered together and said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses reported the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I am coming to you in a thick cloud that the people may hear, <clears throat> excuse me, when I speak with you and may also believe you forever. Jump to verse 16. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God and they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain and the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain and Moses went up. And the Lord said to Moses, go down and warn the people lest they break through to the Lord to look and many of them perish. Also let the priests who come near to the Lord consecrate themselves lest the Lord break out against them. And Moses said to the Lord, the people cannot come up to Mount Sinai for you yourself warned us saying, set limits around the mountain and consecrate it. And the Lord said to him, go down and come up bringing Aaron with you. But do not let the priests and the people break through to come up to the Lord lest he break out against them. So Moses went down to the people and told them. It's 
hard not to imagine being there, right? In this dramatic act of grace, the transcendent creator of the universe steps down onto Mount Sinai, making creation writhe in smoke and fire and lightning. And he makes his covenant with Israel who has just accepted his offer. And on this mountain, he gives his law for how they are to live out this brand new identity. Now the Mosaic covenant, that's really what we're going to be focusing on um, tonight. The Mosaic covenant or the old covenant is the namesake for our Old Testament, right? We can rightly divide uh, our Bibles between the, we call it the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the same wording, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, right? This is definitive for the first two thirds of the Bible, what we're reading and studying right now. Uh, This covenant begins by looking back to Exodus. If you notice in chapter 20, verses one and two, let's look at those. So God has just come down and God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It begins by looking back to what he had just done. And uh, as you continue to read and study with us throughout the entire course of the Bible, it becomes a pattern in redemptive history that those who have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb are invited into the freedom of obeying the law of the Lord. I'll say it again, it's a pattern in redemptive history that those who have been uh, uh, redeemed by the blood of the Lamb are invited into obeying the law of the Lord, the freedom of that law. Then we get to verse 3, and verse 3 introduces the famous Ten Commandments, or literally, uh, it's the, the Ten Words. Ten Words. Now, Jewish, Catholic, and Protestant traditions uh, have different ways of enumerating these commands with their differences really focusing on the first two commands and then the last one. So I've included in your notes a chart for how these different traditions enumerate them. And I'm not going to really spend a lot of time here. There is so much interesting stuff that was very thought-provoking to me in study this last week. Um, we don't have time uh, to, to, to really cover this chart in depth, but I would encourage you to really consider the differences um, and not be quick to write them off because there may be some gems there that uh, we might be missing. Uh, and so regardless of which tradition you ascribe to, I think that there are some key textual elements that help us understand the 10 as a whole. Okay? Understand the 10 as a whole. Now, um, what I want to do is I actually just want to read through the 10 commandments, verses 3 through 17. And so let's look at that together. Verse 3, Exodus 20. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Okay, again, I think that there's some important textual elements here that help us to understand the Ten Commandments as 
a whole. And the first is that the commandments related to God include motivations. They include motivation statements. Notice in uh, verse 5, why shall you not have any graven image before God, right? For, what does he say in verse 5? I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. So don't do this because of this. There's a motivation, okay? In verse 7, don't take the name of the Lord in vain. What's the purpose? The motivation behind keeping that commandment. What does he say? You guys looking? For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Uh, and then the whole Sabbath command between, uh, or from verses 8 to 11. What's the command there? Why does he say they are commanded to keep the Sabbath? Okay, right, because of the creation order. God made the world in six days. He rested on the seventh day and made it holy. So that is a pattern for your week. There's motivations here for each one. Okay, so that's interesting to note. It's important. Second textual element is that the commands related to God and the command to honor parents include the name Lord your God. So in verse 5, I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. Verse 7, don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Uh, the Sabbath command, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy, right? The seventh day is a Sabbath day to the Lord your God. And then in verse 12, Honor your father and your mother that the, your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. And so the Lord your God is mentioned in those beginning commands, but he's not mentioned in any of the simple moral prohibitions later on. Okay? And if you're like, who cares? It's important. Hang on with me. Okay? Uh, the third textual element is that the command to honor parents is the only one with a promise. It's the only one with a promise. And so, uh, think about this. The command to honor your parents, is that a command rela uh, dealing with how we relate to God or how we relate to people? People. Our parents are, they're not God, <laughs> right? Uh, they're people, okay? Um, but, rather than just grouping and honor your parents into those other commands, don't murder, don't steal, no adultery, the whole thing, the fact that it has a promise is unique. And then the fact that it names, again, the Lord your God, like those beginning commandments, dealing with God is also very important. This is significant because, you guys, verse 12, the command to honor your parents acts as the linchpin between the first few commands dealing with how to have a right relationship with God and the, the last handful of commands dealing with how to have right relationships with people. It connects the two. Now, let me just ask you this. Why would this command, why do you think the command to honor your parents would connect loving God and then loving people? Why would this be so important, the linchpin between the two? Okay, people who are in authority over you, that's certainly true, right? When you're a kid, your parents functionally are like God. How you act toward your kids, they see God in you. That's a huge responsibility, Right? Ashley, what do you think? Same thing? Okay. Beth, what were you going to say? Right. Right, they teach you, they grow and develop you. This is so fascinating to me. Why is this command the connection between the commands toward God and the commands toward people? Because it's in the covenant community of the family where love for God, love for people, and love for creation in general is taught. As one scholar puts it, the home is the foundation of human society and the community where we should first learn covenant love. Think about the significance of that. This is why it is so important to have homes that are led by godly moms and dads. This is why it's so significant. And Highland, this is why it's so significant that the attacks from the enemy or the world on families poses such a threat to society. 
This is the basic unit where love for God, covenant love and faithfulness to God is to be passed down from generation to generation. It's also the place where kids are supposed to learn what it means to be in covenant love with people, how to treat people correctly. And so for society to say, we just need to dissolve the family, no, no, that is not what we need. It is anti-biblical. That's established here. It's so, so clear. What would you say? You can't have one without the other? What do you mean? Man, come on, Rhonda. You're living in the future. We're about to study 1 John, okay? Uh, maybe I wasn't supposed to say that. I think we're going to study 1 John after Acts. And John, the Apostle John, is just like, if you say you love God and you're not a people person, like you just don't really like people, you're a liar. If you don't love people, you cannot love God. How can you love God whom you don't see if you don't love people that you can see? Man, and so I just had never seen these commands that way. The commands to love God, no graven images before God, to mediate his presence, to aid in worship, none of that. Uh, don't use the name of God to do evil things. Don't take the name of God in vain, right? That's much more than just saying, oh my God. That's not what this is talking about. I don't think we should say that, but that's not what this is talking about, okay? Uh, the command to keep the Sabbath holy, right? It's an act of consecration to God, trust in God that I'm not going to work. I'm gonna choose today to rest. That's an act of trust in God. That is held together, uh, with don't murder, no adultery, no stealing, no false witness, no coveting. The whole thing that holds that together is honor your parents. It's just fascinating. The Bible is unbelievably wise in its in, uh, instruction and in its uh, construction of the family unit, right? As the place where all of this is passed down. And so um, in your notes, I've included very short summaries for the first few commands relating to God, which I'm not going to cover in detail tonight, but um, I hope that that's a, that can be like a quick reference to you in the future as you're like, what does it mean to not take the name of God in vain? Uh, it's just a few sentences for you, okay? Um, okay, another interesting observation about the Ten Commandments, but specifically the last handful of commandments, is that they are phrased as prohibitions in the second person singular. And you're like, dude, you are losing me. It is 7.40 on a Wednesday night. It's been dark for two hours. Like, what are we doing? Think about this. Highland, why would verses 13 to 17, why would they be phrased as negative prohibitions? Do not, rather than do. And why would they be phrased in the second person singular? He's saying you, not you, you do not steal. You do not bear false witness. You do not murder. Why would that be? Why would God phrase them this way? Hmm. Okay, yeah, certainly for the second person singular, that is certainly true. It's aiming at you as an individual. Um, so we can't just skirt by by being part of the group while not being faithful. Okay, that's some of it, yeah. Any other ideas? Why would this be the case? Okay, personal, right? Second person singular, again, because it's like God is speaking to everyone and then he's like, hey, don't murder. And you're like, check. <laughs> you know, like, okay, yes. Yeah. You have control over you, yep. Okay. Let me ask this though. If God said, you do not murder, would we be fine to just get away with that? Like, I didn't know. I mean, you were talking to the whole group. I didn't, you didn't make eye contact with me when you said it. I was just like, you know, I really like lying. So bearing false witness is one of my strengths. So just... No, like, we wouldn't get away with that, right? Okay, this is really, really interesting. 
Why would these be do not instead of do? Because God wants each individual to think about the rights of others before they think about their own rights. Think about this. No murder. Think about their right to life. No adultery. Think about the right of every person to his or her own home. Or no stealing. The right of every person to his or her own property. No bearing false witness. The right of every person to his or her own reputation. God is saying, I want you to think about them. In the prohibition, do not do this. Do not do this. Why? Because of them. Think about them. And then you get to the last one, do not covet. Uh, And God brings this whole thing from the possibility of us, like I'm gonna uh, externally conform to God's law on the outside, but my heart's not really gonna be with him. Then he says, no, don't covet. He gets right to the heart. Paul, later on in the Bible, says, I wouldn't have known, right, not to covet if the law said do not covet. He, He makes it about the, the heart here. Don't wish that uh, someone else's life was yours. That's basically coveting, right? Um, and so these prohibitions, he's wanting his people to be selfless, open, generous. Think about other people before you think about yourself. And if we were to take um, all the 10 words, as it were, right, the 10 commandments, and if we were to sum it up in like a phrase or two, if you wanted to sum up the Ten Commandments, what would be a phrase just off the top of your head that you would say? Love God with all your heart, soul, and strength. And another one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Think about this in the context of what it means for them to be this brand new covenant people of God who bear the name of God in the world for the sake of the nations. This is huge, okay? Now, the 10 words are relatively easy to understand, right? There's not a whole lot of like, I don't know, exegesis when he's like, don't steal. Like, what does that mean? No, you get what it means, right? Um, But once we move into the rest of the law, and let me know if you're the same way as me, it can feel like we're in our own wilderness wandering, you're reading all the laws and you just get lost. I don't know what this is talking about. Laws about altars, servants, the tabernacle dimensions. I either am overwhelmed by them or I'm bored by them or there's a mixture of both, okay? And where do these laws fit into the story? Uh, here's the best way to understand these laws. Okay, and there's some blanks in your notes if you want to fill this out, but the 10 words slash 10 commandments are uncontextualized general laws. They're very simple. By having no specific context, they really apply to every context. It's not, don't bear false witness if it's a Tuesday and you're in court and you've known the other person for five years. It's just don't bear false witness. So uncontextualized general laws. The other laws, really from... um, Uh, verse 22 in chapter 20 through the end of verse 23 are what we call judgments. Judgments. These are case laws. These are judicial precedents that apply the 10 words to specific contexts. So when you think about the law and it's like, man, it's really overwhelming, just think of it like this. You got the 10 commandments, general laws. All of the rest are applying those 10 commandments to specific situations. Okay? Okay. The judgments don't cover every detail, but they are meant to be a model for how Israel was to conduct itself as a holy nation. And remember, too, that as we're talking about the law, the Torah, you guys remember what Torah means? We covered this weeks ago. Assessment time. We said Torah doesn't mean law, like we Americans think of it, as much as it means instruction. Someone said it instruction, okay? And so uh, I've included, I think I've included in your notes a basic outline of the uh, kind of chapters 19 to 40 about the giving of the law. Uh, Is that included in there? Okay. Um, And so after giving the 10 words and judgments, Moses brings Aaron, Aaron's sons, and 70 elders, right, representing all of Israel, up the mountain to worship, Moses offers the covenant, after he's received it from God, he offers the covenant to the people and they accept. 
So if you've got your Bibles, let's go to chapter 24. This is where we're going to conclude. And... Uh, yeah, I want to read chapter 24, verses 1 to 11, okay? So then he said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, it's Aaron's sons, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. Okay, so all that we just covered was he wrote down in this so-called book of the covenant. Okay, he's reading it to the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. And so again, this law is given, and Moses goes up with this little crew to the mountain. He offers the law of God, the covenant of God to the people they accept in verse 3. And this next day, uh, that same small group, Moses, Aaron, Aaron's sons, 70 elders representing all of Israel, go up the mountain again. Uh, and verse 11 says they eat a meal in his presence. They eat a meal in his presence. This is a lullaby effect thing for me. I read that and I'm like, whatever, man, they just ate. No, this is actually really important. Uh, there is a ceremony, uh, a cultural ceremony. It's all over the world and it has been for a really long time uh, that very closely resembles this meeting with God. And it's marriage. It's marriage. It's a wedding Two parties who are not related by blood are joined together in a covenant. Notice that when they offer sacrifices, Moses sprinkles the blood on the altar, God's altar, and uh, the people, or likely those 12 pillars he set up for the people, right? And on the people. So they're joined together in the blood of the covenant. They exchange gifts. This would have been customary for Jewish weddings. God's gift is the giving of the law, and the gifts of the people are the offering of sacrifices, okay? And then they share a celebratory meal together. And so the metaphor here in chapter 24 with the ratification of the covenant changes from Israel being God's firstborn son and their responsibility in the world, right? It changes from the firstborn son idea to now Israel is considered to be God's bride, in the giving of the law, God essentially proposes to and marries his people. Highland, hear me when I say this. In the giving of the law, God proposes to and marries the people of Israel. And this kind of spousal language is used further on in the prophets, especially in the books of Ezekiel and Hosea. And too often, Christians badly misunderstand 
the Mosaic Covenant and the giving of the law. It's so sad to me. And I remember when this changed for me, it changed a whole lot. We think of the giving of the law as some like cold legislative event in which the people of God dread God and God says, if you follow my rules, you go to heaven and if you break my rules, you go to hell. Highland, let me be clear, that is a very bad idea. It's a bad idea and it's inaccurate, not only to the text, but to the meta narrative of scripture as a whole. And so if you think that this Exodus, the old covenant, um, is rules-based entrance into heaven, you should take that thought, you should crumple it up, and you should throw it away. It is not accurate. Not only is it uh, inaccurate, an inaccurate understanding of what the law really is, right? The text, heaven, hell, none of that is even mentioned. It's not here, okay? Um, but it's also a misrepresentation of God. God is not, he... Let me just ask you, has the Bible put forth a God who is mechanistic and transactional in his dealing with people? No, it hasn't. It hasn't. God is not that way. He had already saved his people. Think about this. In the context of Exodus, in one book, that idea is completely undone. He already saved his people. He delivered them miraculously from slavery. He's delivered them. He's not enforcing some legalistic, salvific code here. No, he is marrying Israel in the desert. Like he's inviting them, saying, you, do you want to be my treasured possession? I require obedience, but do you want to be my treasured possession? Do you want to partner with me as a kingdom of priests where I'm going to plant you right in the center of the earth, the known world? I'm going to plant you right in the middle. And we'll cover that much in much more detail next semester. But right where I'm going to plant you, you get to show the nations what I am truly like. You get to show the nations what it's like to be a true humanity. You're going to be a holy nation. Kingdom of priests, that's what I'm calling you to. If the whole world was like a ring on my finger, you would be the diamond in it. You're my crown jewel. Do you accept? This is what the giving of the law is. It's, it's a wedding. It's an invitation. I have some quotes in your notes uh, that I have time to read. And so I'm going to read them. Uh, this is uh, theologian Stephen Wellam. He says this, much misunderstanding has been caused by comparing the old covenant to the new in terms of law and grace. The text is clear. The old covenant is based on grace and grace motivates the keeping of the covenant just as we find in the new covenant. God had protected the people and provided for them during the difficult desert journey, bearing them on eagle's wings, so to speak, and had so arranged their itinerary as to bring them to himself, that is to Sinai, the mountain of God. This text teaches then that the basis for the covenant from the point of view of the human partner was confidence and trust in as well as gratitude to Yahweh as established by the events of the Exodus. And then Paul House, the book you are going to read this week. The very genesis of the law is grace for it is instituted by Yahweh who led Israel out of Egypt based not on Israel's intrinsic merit but based rather on Yahweh's promises to Abraham. This is not some graceless cold, old thing. This is the living God partnering with this people to reverse the curse, to bring the world back to him, going all the way back to the master plan so that his glory will cover the entire earth. And so, honestly, I, I know I'm really fired up about this, but I just think it's so bad, like the Jews really thought, like their heart wasn't in it, and it was like, if I obey these rules, then God will let me in if... Really, that's what they thought? That's what Moses thought? No, it's wrong. So I think that we need to ditch this idea that the Old Covenant is just some heartless legal system of salvation and see it in the context of the meta-narrative of Scripture. God made a promise to Abraham that his descendants would bless the whole world and that they would be as numerous as the stars. And it was in Egypt, the nursery, right? Where this small little family grows into this massive 
nation. And then God invites them out into the desert where he proposes to them. He proposes to them. He wants to be their husband, as it were. He wants them to be his special treasure by being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation who would show the world what it's like to live in right relationship to God and right relationship to people. And so I just want to leave you with this thought. Let's have better ideas and understandings of the Torah, Genesis through Deuteronomy. Let's have a higher view of the character of God. Let's maybe respect the story here a little bit more deeply. And our understanding will continue to be clarified as we study throughout the Bible. But remember, Highland, that tonight, if you are in Christ, this brand new identity that God has for his people is yours. This living God on top of Mount Sinai now invites you up to Mount Zion in Christ. He says, don't stand far off, don't dread me, no, now come near to me and then you will be my treasured possession. Take on the identity, kingdom of priests, all of you, take on the identity. We are a holy nation, a holy people, not against the nations of the world, but for them. We are for them in Christ. They are not our enemies. I hope that would be really challenging to us to think about this differently and to think about ourselves differently as well. There is so much more in the book of Exodus, especially chapters 32 and chapter 34. Uh, but an explanation uh, of a lot of those really important ideas will come if you watch those videos that are uh, in the homework and that will be posted on the website either tomorrow or Friday, okay? And so, I hope that you guys are blessed. Uh, we will meet again um, in three weeks. Three weeks, okay? December 4th, where we're gonna do a review. Come with your questions. I will probably not be able to answer all of them, but I'll do my best. And we'll review um, the story of God throughout the entire book of Genesis and the entire book of Exodus, okay? Father, we are grateful for your word that you are slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. And tonight, God, I pray that if we've had bad ideas about you or about your word, Father, help us to correct those things. Help us to think accurately about your word. And God, I pray that the men and women in this room, when they consider their lives themselves, that a, an integral part of that would be that they are part of the kingdom of priests and part of your holy nation because they are your people. We love you, Father. Go with us this week. Give us success in living for you, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Whew. Amen. Good to be with you guys. God bless you, and we'll see you Sunday morning.